Episode 1, Cultivating Change, a journey into regenerative homesteading in the right to farm with Randy Buchler of Shady Grove Farm UP. Welcome to This Artisan Life, the podcast where we delve into the stories of individuals embracing unconventional lives driven by their passions. I'm your host, Michelle Dupra. In today's episode, we have the pleasure of sitting down with Randy Buchler, a small farmer in Upper Michigan. Randy is a fervent advocate for food freedom, a movement aimed at fostering transparency and sustainability within our food system through the principles of permaculture, along with everyone's right to farm. Join us as Randy shares his remarkable path back to health and fulfillment after a debilitating spine injury led him to discover his profound joy of farming. He'll offer insights into homesteading and discuss how he navigated a local lawsuit that threatened his family's way of life. So without further ado, let's dive in. Thank you, Randy, for coming on This Artist in Life. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Awesome. So I had the pleasure of visiting Randy's farm this last weekend for one of his hog harvests. And let me tell you, it was a very enlightening experience. And I am very grateful for the time that I got to join you and be a part of your hog harvest. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but just set the scene for our viewers of what your farm looks like and where it's located. Sure. So we're Shady Grove Farm UP. We're located in Gwynn, Michigan, in the central upper peninsula. Um, We live at what was my wife's grandparents' property. It's been in her family since the 1940s. When they had it, it was 13 acres with about 600 feet of lakefront on Johnson Lake. We currently have six and a half acres, and we utilize about two acres of that for our permaculture system. Um, Our property is really long. It's, I want to say at the longest, it's about 1,200 feet. We have two lots. They're narrow, but they're long, and they go a long ways away from the lake and actually go across the road. We have property on the other side. So, um, you know, when people hear about having a, farm on a lake all of a sudden it gets questioned Mm -hmm. but we have plenty of property to where the setbacks are within the uh setback limits that the department of agriculture wants to see and such so um you know everything's far away from the lake and it's all very concentrated in about one and a half to two acres okay so when people think stereotypical farm and they're picturing rolling hills and big red barns that's not what we have here. Your operation is much smaller. What kind of animals and plants, what do you mainly focus on in your farm? It's super diverse. Um, We've got a lot of perennial plants. Um, We have two greenhouses where we do a lot of annual uh, greens, tomatoes, peppers, things like that. And then we have, I keep a flock of laying chickens. Our primary product is organic soy and corn-free eggs. Uh, And then I also do Broiler chickens, I I raise Freedom Rangers, we have wool sheep, meat sheep, and I also raise pigs. And I'll do Thanksgiving turkeys as well every so often. Okay, awesome. So uh, obviously with your farm, some people use the term homesteading. Is there really any difference between having a homestead and having a farm? I think homesteading is, it's a non-commercial way of life, so to speak. A lot of people homestead and they're just producing at least some of their own food, if not most. And, you know, we, I would say, are a good combination of homesteading and commercial farm. Um, We produce a lot of food for ourselves, and then we have the commercial aspect of selling eggs. I do sell some meat to people, uh, Farm Direct, and Libby makes clothing out of our sheep's wool. There's the commercial aspect and then the homesteading aspect. So it's a, it's a nice combination. Awesome. Yeah. So what actually got you into this lifestyle? Where did it, where did your story begin? It goes back to when we lived in Colorado. Um, when we graduated college, we moved out West, wanted to live in the mountains and live this healthy lifestyle. We have degrees in outdoor and environmental recreation, which obviously have taken us nowhere as far as <laughs> the college degree part goes, but it did get us, uh, on the path to where we are today. So we were living in, uh, The mountains, 9,000 feet elevation, trying to grow a garden. We were eating meat at the time. And, you know, we started thinking more about where the meat was coming from and how it was being produced. And and we realized we knew nothing about it. And it was kind of weird to us. So ironically, we became vegetarians and stayed that way for 10, 12 years. And 
Till one day a friend who hunts brought over some bighorn sheep steaks <laughs> and cooked them on the grill at our house in Colorado. And I think this would have been like the 11th or 12th year of being vegetarians. And, and we both couldn't resist. And, and that was our path back to getting back into eating animal foods. But we knew everything about that animal. And that was the connection for us on how we needed to move forward with how we were going to properly give our bodies the nutrition that they needed, which then led into when we moved back to Michigan, when our daughter was born, we need to start raising our own food in the form of plants and animals. Going from a vegetarian diet back to eating meat, but making it really mindful where the process of how you got your meat, where it came from, that was what drove you into farming. And Yeah. I mean, the best way for us to know was for us to do it ourselves. Um, so we started slow with we got some chickens for eggs, and and then from there it was like, well, chickens are pretty easy, you know. Maybe we could get some sheep, and so we got some sheep, and then Libby started using the wool to spin yarn and knit, and started making sweaters for the kids, and and uh, and then we harvested a sheep, and we're like, well, we should get some sheep for meat as well, and have dual purpose animals, okay. and you know, it just kind of, <laughs> you know, like they joke, you know, be careful, chickens are the gateway. <laughs> animal a, for farming you know it's a slippery slope yeah i think brian this weekend mentioned that as well it seemed like everything he got it was the next got a one up it yep yep <laughs> okay so what you mentioned on your farm you practice integrative regenerative permaculture can you give us kind of an idea of what exactly that means when you look at industrial agriculture for example a lot of it is like monoculture monocrop soy or corn or like a a CAFO, confined animal feeding operation, where it's like all pigs, there's no diversity. And to have a healthy system and ecosystem, you want diversity. So the integrative part is integrating all different plants and animals together into the same system. You know, we've got annual plants and perennial plants, and, you know, we interplant those even. And and then all the animals are integrated. You know, their pens are all neighboring and sometimes even... Uh, there'll be some chickens in with the sheep. So the integrative part is just having everything in your system working together. And then the animal inputs benefit all of the plants and the soil. Um, and the regenerative aspect is just basically doing things in such a way that it's healing to the land, healing to the water, healing to the air, healing to everything around it. And And what we've seen over the last 20 years of doing this is just this huge diversity of different species of life coming back to our property. It's been incredible to watch. When we moved there, it was just, you know, I mean, you'd see squirrels and deer every now and then, but now we're seeing all kinds of butterflies and pollinators and frogs and toads and snakes and birds. And, and it's just been incredible to see the life that has come back. And instead of things just being alive, things are thriving now. So regenerative meaning regenerating the land, but also just working in that closed mm -hmm. system and how everything's affected by yeah. one another. And, and, you know, also like when I do my animal harvest, for example, a zero waste animal harvest, um, what we don't consume for ourselves or use for us, maybe the dogs will get some or the chickens will get some, but what none of the animals use, the rest of it goes into my compost piles and my compost piles eat it. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes part of our living soil, which all goes back into the system. So we've gone from really sandy soil to now we have soil that's alive and thriving. And I have soil consultant uh, look at the stuff under microscope and analyze and quantify the microbiology to make sure that what we need is present in the soil to make everything above the ground as healthy as what's below the ground. So soil is much more complex. Than oh, much. And I think yeah. what you had mentioned to me about your compost piles, you said, you know, a lot of people think, oh, I'm just going to go down to the farm down the road and grab some compost. And maybe what you're getting is mainly animal manure. And you had mentioned about how you actually turn your compost piles and test them for quality. You're getting a lot different product than just going and getting manure. Yeah. You know, the most important part of soil, are, it's the things we can't see. And it sounds great to just get a pile of manure from a farm, you know, that was compost um, and everybody thinks that it's, you know, when you put this into your garden that everything is just going to flourish. Um, 
But if it's not composted properly and it's anaerobically digested and there's a high count of bacteria and not a lot of fungal activity, if it's not composted right, you're not going to have all the beneficial things that you need. And it's, it's a huge learning curve. Like I don't have time to become a soil scientist, but I have friends who are, and I've learned a ton from them. The recipe that I use for compost, for example, is uh, it's from a woman, Elaine Ingham is her name. She's like one of our country's leading soil experts. And, uh, you know, it's 60% carbon, 30% green, 10% nitrogen. So a lot of the compost that people are going to get from the farm down the road, it's 80% nitrogen. And it's probably from compost piles that aren't turned very often, and they're not monitoring the internal temperatures. So I'll get wood chips from local tree companies. I'll have them dump them at my place. I pile them with my tractor. I let them age. That starts the fungal activity in the wood chips. And then that's 60% of each compost pile. And then 30% in the form of plant matter. So I'm going to plant a lot more comfrey this year. It's a really good one. Uh, we have stinging nettle everywhere, which is a really good sign of soil health. So we chop that, put it in the piles. When we weed, I feed it to the chickens, but I put some in the compost. And then only 10% nitrogen. And I only use my chicken manure for my compost. Okay. So it's, yeah, it's a whole another level of science and i have three foot probe compost thermometers that i monitor the temperatures so it lets me know when i need to turn them yeah and for a lot of people that's a waste product for me it's i, I consider myself a soil farmer um and then the soil does the rest so if i can get the soil to a point where it's almost biocomplete is what they call it where it's got everything you need and at high levels then everything above the ground will do wonderfully I think you mentioned, or I heard you mention once, you're like, soil is living, dirt is dead. Yes. Yep. So when you see huge corn and soy mm -hmm. operations, for example, their soil's not alive. They've killed it, spraying it with chemicals. Therefore, they have to use synthetic inputs in order to make their things grow. You know, like GMO soy, things that you can spray with Roundup. that like it'll kill everything but the plant that you want to grow. Um, so if, they, if you were to look at their soil um it's not alive you know there's the chemicals are killing all the life that you want so weeds are a part of gardening they are <laughs> they yeah. need to be a weed is something that grows where you don't want it to grow doesn't mean it's a bad thing it's just somewhere where you don't want it so when we remove weeds i've learned to just embrace the fact that it's not a weed at all that's chicken feed oh hmm. that's not a weed at all that's pig feed or sheep feed. Um, you know, we have a lot of quack grass around some of our garden areas, and I tried for years to eliminate it, and we would dig it up and try to get rid of it, but it, you can't. So finally, I was like, all right, let's get a push more with a grass catcher and embrace it. And it adds to the aesthetics of the farm, and it's pretty, and it feels good to walk on barefoot. Gives you a spot to put some lawn chairs to sit down in the evening and relax. And so I use a push more with a grass catcher, and I just mow the quack grass and Instead of my chickens being on pasture, I bring the pasture to them in the form of cutting the grass and weeding. You know, so those are all things that you have to work with what nature's doing versus trying to combat it. So really, it's about changing your perspective. It is. And understanding we're not in control. As much as we want to be, we are there to facilitate a system and manage it and if you're paying attention, the system's going to tell you what it is that it wants to do. Mm -hmm. So it's not about what I think that I can control. It's about me paying attention enough to maybe make some adjustments to let Mother Nature do what it's going to do anyway. And I like the idea, like you said, being a facilitator, because when I was thinking about your role in how you raise your pigs, and right up through to the end, you really, truly are, in my eyes, the facilitator of this pig's best possible life. And so it's not just what the pig gives you in the end. It's, it's really the full circle of from the time you bring the pig onto the farm and how you're raising it, you're facilitating this pig's best life in highest possible purpose. So knowing what it is that you can control and then embracing the things that are outside of your control, but really just having that perspective on both. And, you know, the pigs, in a sense, facilitate the quality of my life, too, because mm -hmm. we have this year-long uh, reciprocal relationship where I'm giving them 
high quality feed and I'm giving them back scratchings and love and compassion and everything that they need to live a life that's filled with peace and stress free and mm -hmm. comfort. And, and in turn, they're giving me love back. And every morning they want me to scratch their back <laughs> and they're rubbing up against me. And, you know, there's just something for me that's incredibly enjoyable to work with animals every single day. And animal husbandry can be really good or it can be really bad. And it's something that I take pride in with providing the absolute best life that I can to my animals because that's what they deserve. Mm -hmm. The thing that I've taken on myself to provide the entirety of the best mm -hmm. life would be the harvesting. So to keep the full circle of life on the farm is the one thing that it took me a while to get there, but I knew it was something that I ended up having to do for the animals. Sure. You know, I couldn't raise the animals the way I do and then put them in a trailer and take them somewhere else and just ignore the fact that they're not going to be killed with the same intention that I would do it on the farm. And it was very obvious to get to observe your process. It really is a ritual, it's something that you take great care in, how it goes down. And I was really thankful to get to experience that and be a part of it. I think it's the antithesis of what happens in factory farms, and it's what makes your work so much um, more important. Yeah. It makes well, it. Thanks. And so that kind of brings me into my next point. You know, you mentioned uh, through caring for these animals, it really helps facilitate your best life. And that wasn't always the case. This wasn't what you used to do full time. Can you tell me a little bit of kind of the story of how you got into farming more full time? When we first moved up here, um, I was bartending for a while because that's what I did in Colorado and in some casinos out there. And, you know, we sold our house after our daughter was born, moved to the UP into Libby's grandparents' place. And, and I was like, you know, just get into bartending because that's what I know. It's easy to get that job. And uh, so I did that for a while and became a sea kayak instructor as well. And I did guided trips along Pictured Rocks and Grand Island. And, you know, while I was doing those two jobs, Libby was a stay-at-home mom. And I was also searching for something that was more of a career versus just a job. And, and I realized quickly up here that careers are pretty specialized here. Um, but then a, a buddy of mine came in one day and he's like, hey, you know, this tree company's hiring, you know, they're doing line clearance tree trimming. And uh, so I, I applied and ended up doing this trimming, tree trimming along the power lines for several years and ended up having a spine injury in 2008. And uh, I broke the lower part of my spine at work and my spine was going back and forth on my sacrum and, and ended up needing surgery and cadaver bone. and which ended up rendering me disabled. I have permanent nerve damage and my left leg doesn't work right. I have drop foot. And uh, so I was off, off work for a long time with that and started to think about what we could do to keep my body moving. And I knew that I, I couldn't just lay around and watch TV and, you know, be on pain meds. And so I, I didn't do the pain meds and we, that's, essentially when we started adding more things to the farm stuff. So it gave me more to do. So what initially started as kind of more of a hobby then kind of evolved into this way to keep your body strong and keep you active, keep you moving. And through doing that, you kind of realized, hey, you actually really enjoyed that kind of work. And I think um, you had mentioned to me once, you said, well, if I only knew it would take a spine injury yeah. to move into this lifestyle more full time. Yeah, you know, I was an athlete my whole life, and, and I've always been just a busybody. And uh, that spine injury was humbling, and it just put me in a place of, this isn't going to work for me to not be active. Mm -hmm. I've always been active. I've always been athletic. I've rock climbed. I've ice climbed. I've done all these things. And, and to not be active, just, I wasn't going to accept that. So, you know, that's what, you know, playing college baseball and you know, almost getting drafted, like all these things were just going through my mind, like, okay, this is where I was, and I'm I'm not going to stray too far from that because of an injury, even though it was life-changing and debilitating, and I would, I couldn't go back to work. Um, just kept telling Libby, I'm like, I need more to do around here, <laughs> you know, and, and we just kept expanding stuff, and, and then finally started selling some of the eggs to get some revenues generated to buy feed for other animals, and um, yeah, it just jump-started it, and then I was like, man, I really like this, you know, this is, 
great, you know, reaping the rewards of not just working to keep my body healthy, but now I'm able to give it the proper nutrition from food that's right outside our door. Like, this is really cool. That's amazing. Yeah. Fast forward, I want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that you face. So I'm not sure the year it was, but you're recovering from the spine surgery and you go to the mailbox mm -hmm. one day. Yeah. And so, you know, my, my injury was 2008, January. Uh, I actually held off on the surgery until June. I was trying to do physical therapy and stuff and it got to the point of, you know, they did some more imaging under flexion and extension and it just wasn't going to heal. So they did the surgery. So now I'm in recovery mode after a major spine surgery and uh, going through a workman's comp battle and fighting for social security disability. And part of my everyday therapy was walking, you know, and so I'd walk down to the mailbox. We've got a driveway that's an eighth mile long and uh, go down to the mailbox and I, there's an envelope in there from Forsyth Township. And I was like, I wonder what this is. And, and at that time, we had chickens and sheep and bigger garden spaces. And so I opened the letter and on the way back, and I'm reading it and I'm walking with my cane. And, and this letter said that it had come to their attention that we had ch chickens and goats and that in the Lake Residential District, agricultural activity was not allowed and that we had to cease and desist all agricultural activity now. And I thought to myself, we don't have goats, <laughs> we have sheep, <laughs> you know? So uh, immediately it was like, okay, obviously somebody turned us in. Was a shock to you because you didn't even know that it was a problem. No, I didn't. You know, I'll be 100% honest. I was completely ignorant to zoning stuff. Um, and, and, and I was kind of in disbelief that what we were doing in somebody else's eyes was a bad thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like we had a factory farm on in the lake residential district you know at that time we had maybe 50 chickens and like four sheep but we had six and a half acres like there was tons of room to do what we were doing we were doing things organically like we weren't harming anything we were actually improving things and you know our property across the road connects to what used to be a horse pasture like four houses down from us like when they were growing up they had pigs like it wasn't something new to the area it's just that Nobody was currently doing it at that time but us. When Libby was working uh, as a school bus driver at the time, she had to find something after my spine injury because I had no income and $100,000 in unpaid medical bills that I was fighting to get paid. And one of the people that she worked with uh, lived down the road from us and apparently went into the township office and asked them if we were allowed to have livestock in that zoned district ironically it just happened to be written down on a complaint form and uh, so that's where it all stemmed from was it what i was told to be an inquiry and uh yeah so you know my first thought was okay that's not going to work for me. we can't cease and desist what we're doing because it's now becoming a way of life it's not just a a hobby mm -hmm. And uh, so I had to figure out how I was going to protect our right to farm. So this was truly a threat to your lifestyle. This wasn't just something that mm -hmm. you were, you know, dabbling in for fun. This had become your full-time lifestyle. It was right. something you immersed yourself in, you were very dedicated to. And, and it wasn't just a threat to my lifestyle. It was a threat to what I considered to be a threat to our health, right? Like we were doing everything we could do to optimize our own personal health. And the best way to do that was to take responsibility for our own food supply at some level. That's a great point to make. Yeah. yeah. And it was also a threat to my recovery because what I was doing was part of my recovery from my spine injury. You know, so at that point I was like, well, if I stop doing this, then what? Am I going to become that disabled guy on the couch? It catapulted me into, okay, how can we make this work? So instead of letting it stop you, you took the initiative to, you got, you put into action, how do I make this work? And so you went into research mode of understanding more about what the law was and what the problem was as well, far as the, the zoning. Thing, first thing was, is I had to respond to the township, you know? So at that point I wasn't in research mode, I was in reply mode and 
And it was, you know, an anxiety cause. I was already going through hell. I mean, you know, I was in two lost legal battles for workman's comp and disability. I was in a bad mental place, anxiety, depression, fear. How was I going to feed my family? Like all these things, you know, we're going to lose everything because I don't have an income anymore. And the company that I worked for was being super hardcore and not cooperative. And they were trying everything in their power to make me lose the workman's comp case. And then this township thing was like the third thing that came in. And so I was like, all right, well, I'm already in battle mode with workman's comp and disability. (laughs) So let's go, you know, and, but I, you know, I didn't look at the township thing as battle at that time. I looked at it like, okay, I need to go communicate with these people and figure out what is the problem. So what was your initial response? Um, You know, I had to go down and address the fact, I, I actually corrected them. I'm like, we don't have goats, we have sheep, you know? And, um, but I'm like, why, why is it an issue in this? You know, I went down and I talked to them and, and uh, they just said that in their zoning, agricultural activity is not allowed. It's not a conditional or a permissible use of that zoned district. Lake Residential District was the highest taxed district. And that was a no-no. So I'm like, well, how can we make this work? You know, I mean, we're here you know, we're newer in the community. I mean, we've been there for eight years, but, um, you know, we're here to do good things. Like we don't want to do any harm and we're not doing any harm. And, you know, how can we make this work? And they were like, well, we don't think we can. And I'm like, well, I do think we can, you know, I mean, so I started attending township meetings and I would try to garner community support and have people come and speak during public comment periods. And we had tons of people that were supportive of what we were doing. And, you know, we were instrumental in starting the Gwynn Farmer's Market with some other people, and then Libby took over managing the Farmer's Market. And as we're managing and running the Farmer's Market every week, we're also in this, I don't want to call it a fight, it was just this back and forth with the township, and our Farmer's Market was run through the township. Like, we were doing it at a township park, all the finances ran through the township offices, Um, Libby was the market manager, we had a credit card machine and bridge cards were accepted there. Gwyn's a low-income community, a lot of food assistance people. Here you are trying to integrate into the community all that you do in in the sense of, And we're going to the meetings. Mm -hmm. and um, Yeah, so at the meetings, you know, I was like, well, how can we come up with a compromise? You know, do I need Mm -hmm. to reduce how many chickens I have? You know, uh, that we're trying to bring good food food into the community. Mm -hmm. We're trying to make healthy food available to people of all levels of income. Um, Libby had written a grant for double up food bucks so people with bridge cards could come to the market and get $20, spend $20 off their bridge card, get $40 worth of farmer's market tokens. I had set it up with Mark Tran to make trips, multiple trips during our farmer's market from Sawyer to, to Gwynn to the park so that people without transportation could come and have access to food, good healthy food. You know, so I was bringing all these points up and other community members were coming to the meetings and bringing those points up and and they just wouldn't budge. You know, it was more like a good old boy system that was just like, well, this is the way it is and it's always yeah. been this way. So yeah. therefore we're not going to bend the rules for you. Right. And, and, you know, and change just seemed like it wasn't even going to be on the table. So in the meantime, you're doing all these things with the community and there's this unresolved issue. There's this elephant in the room that just won't go away. So at what point did it come to a head? I had attended, man, I don't even know how many meetings, to be honest, multiple. Um, and I'd realized, okay, this, this isn't going anywhere. And, it, you know, during, after a few meetings, I realized what I was up against. Like I just, my intuition was like, okay, this is going to be really hard. So I did start doing some research on how to protect commercial farm uh, or homesteading or whatever, uh, any type of food production in any zoned district. Like, is, there's got to be something out there that says that we can do this without getting in trouble, you know? And, and at the same time, like, still continuing to work with them. And, like, I volunteered my time, like, this let's form a committee and maybe we could change the zoning to allow people in all zoned districts to produce their own food at some level, Mm -hmm. you know, because there is a way for everybody to do it at some level and do it in an environmentally responsible way. That's not harming anything. Um, 
our neighbor at the time was a science teacher at the Gwynn schools. She brought her class to the lake to do water testing to show that what we were doing was not doing anything to the lake water. Um, we had our well tested. Our well would be the first one to be affected by having a few chickens and some sheep. Everything came back excellent because um, water quality did come up at one of the meetings. And so some of the research I was doing was things that affect water quality. Well, you live on a public lake. There's outboard motors. There's pontoon boats. There's speed boats. There's fishing boats. There's jet skis. In the winter, there's snowmobiles where the exhaust is landing on the snow and um, you know, there's like, you can see rainbows on the surface of the water in the summertime from motors, right? Um, one of our board members lived across the lake from us at the time. And so at one of the next meetings, I had done a bunch of research on the effects of those motors and stuff in water. And, and I brought all these handouts and, and I said, okay, I said, you guys had mentioned water quality. I said, so if that, if that's the issue here, I said, then let's talk about water quality said everything that we're doing is organic and it's not harming water quality at all if anything what we're doing is beneficial to everything around us i said but you sir you ride an old school jet ski on the lake that my children swim in you're dumping 30 percent of your unburned fuel into the lake that my children swim in so if this is about water quality let's talk about water quality i said we're the only people on the lake just about that don't have a motorized watercraft and then I went around and I handed everybody handouts on the pollution aspect of outboard motors and boats and things on water. And I said, now, if it's not about water, water quality, I said, then let's get down to what it's about. Mm -hmm. I said, it's about, I'm not part of your good old boy system. So either we talk about water quality or we quit wasting time and we talk about what the real issue is here. I'm not complying with your wishes to control what I'm doing. And I get that. There's been zoning in place for years, but as a community, we have the ability to change that. Mm -hmm. And I had discovered the Michigan Right to Farm Act at that time, and I went and I handed them all this little excerpt from the Michigan Right to Farm Act, and uh, I showed them there's this state law in Michigan called the Michigan Right to Farm Act, and I said, I'm not sure if you're aware of it or not, I said, but from what I've learned about it, if a farm is compliant with certain aspects of policies within this law, that the state law trumps local zoning. And I gave them all this little ex excerpt from the Right to Farm Act. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I was like, maybe this will get their attention. Mm -hmm. And at the time, there was an attorney on the board who, after reading what I shared with them and doing his own research at the next meeting, he said, I think Mr. Buechler's right here. I think this does protect us. But nobody else would budge on it. And so it just continued. And at one of the meetings that we weren't at, this came to me later, um, it was said that, well, the Buechlers don't have any money. Let's just take them to court. They can't fight this. And that essentially was the justification for them taking us to court, assuming that we wouldn't be able to defend ourselves. However, I was this deep in research at that time. You know otherwise. Yeah. Well, what they didn't know is that I had found another organization called the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. And it's a national organization that helps protect small farms. I reached out to the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund and I presented to them our situation with our township. And at that time, I'd probably done hundreds of hours of research. After talking to Pete Kennedy, the president of the organization at the time, or the director, I don't remember what his title was, but within 15 minutes, he's like, wow, you've really done your homework. And I'm like, well, no offense to lawyers, Pete, I said, but nobody's going to protect me like I'm going to. And uh, so he told me that he had to present it all to the board and he would know probably within a couple of days whether or not they would entertain litigating our case for us. Called me back a couple of days later and he said the board voted that they would take our case. So now I had a whole team of lawyers that agreed to take our case. We didn't have to pay them. They were going to cover the expenses of the case. And that was like my secret weapon. And so you had this all lined up before there was a formal lawsuit filed. I did. Yep. And uh, so when, you know, I and I was doing FOIA requests and I was getting all the meeting minutes, you know, Freedom of Information Act is what that is. And uh, to where you have a right to get public documents and meeting minutes from public meetings. And, you know, so I was 
accumulating all of these things that I was then sharing with these attorneys so that they were brought up to speed on where things were. And uh, yeah, and then finally in 2012, the township attorney at the time stated at one of the meetings that the Buchers have left, uh, left us no choice but to take them to court. And they filed suit against us in Marquette County Circuit Court. At this time when they filed the lawsuit, did you still have your workman's comp lawsuit going on at the time? Or where were, where was your health at this point? So we'd finally gotten to a point of, I think when we found out we were being taken to court, perhaps we hadn't settled the workman's comp stuff yet. Um, but I finally won the workman's comp suit, got the medical bills paid, uh, finally won my social security disability and got back pay. So a lot of the stresses had been relieved financially um, and the mental stress of those battles were gone. And now you were ready to so take on I this next. focus on this. But you know, I was like, all of that took toll. Like I was in a bad place and like just unhappy, miserable to be around from all the battling that I had to do while also trying to recover from health and and then Lyme disease also kicked in at the time, you know, so now I was healing from my spine injury, still had achieved getting over the two loss or legal battles with the work injury. But then Lyme, I started getting sick and, uh, you know, having seizures and losing use of my legs and couldn't figure out why. And, um, and then come to find out it was Lyme disease. So Lyme disease is another thing that affects you mentally and physically. And so I wasn't in a good place at all. And the last thing I was wanting to do was go to court and be in a trial. Um, but I've never been a quitter. I've always been a fighter. And, you know, to be able to hide the anxiety and stress, um, it wasn't easy, but I had to. I knew what I had to do to protect my family, our way of life, and to feed my kids. And, and uh, yeah, so I just kind of mentally went into to hardcore battle mode. I'm like, okay, this is it. You know, we're going, we've got one shot. And, uh, yeah, the trial was scheduled for, I want to say it was November 20th and 21st of 2012. So this all started in 2009, August, 2009 for over three years, we tried to resolve this. So with, you know, I had three years to research and do all the things I was doing while I was trying to just not have to go to court. And then it came down to going to court. And uh, prior to that, there's a program within the Department of Agriculture called the MEAP program. So it's the Michigan Agriculture and Sh Environmental Assurance Program. And, uh, and I found that and I'm like, well, I can proactively have these people come and inspect our farm to see if we are at a point where we could be environmentally verified and be compliant with any state requirements. Mm -hmm. So first it was a local conservation district, can't remember her name, but a woman came and visited the farm and we went through the entire farming system and, and uh, what she basically did was prepped me for what I needed to have ready for when the Department of Agriculture inspectors came. Um, and I was pretty much in a really good position to have them come, but I needed more documentation on paperwork to show them in the form of water usage, manure management plan, an overall farm plan. So I got all that stuff done, and then the Department of Agriculture MEEP inspectors came, and two of them showed up, the director of that program, and then a new inspector for the Upper Peninsula. So we started walking around through the farm, and looking at stuff, and chatting about how the system was functioning, and you know they were saying things like, wow, you've got a lot going on in a small area, and I'm like, yeah, it's called diversity, you know, and they're like, we're not used to seeing this kind of thing. They're used to inspecting industrial agriculture type farms, and so we went through this whole thing and, and, uh, it was a couple of hours probably. And then we went in the house and sat down at the kitchen table and, and they're like, well, you know, congratulations, you know, we feel that you have everything in place to be environmentally verified. And, uh, as soon as you sign this paperwork, you know, you'll have right to farm protection. And the one thing I didn't tell them at that time is we were in the midst of this heated battle with our township because I needed them to remain objective. And and I was doing this so that once we got that MEEP verification, that was proof that we were compliant with any state requirements in order to have right to farm protection. Okay. So there's things called GAMPs, Generally Accepted Agriculture Management Practices. They're voluntary. You don't have to abide by them. But if you are compliant with the ones that apply to your farm, 
that in turn gets you right to farm protection as long as you are commercial in nature. So you have to be a commercial farm, be compliant with the GAMPs, and then that will then gain you right to farm protection. Did you have any knowledge of this before the lawsuit? No. No, I, I was forced to have a workman's comp education. I was forced to have a social security disability education. And then I was forced to become almost a lawyer when it came to the right to farm stuff. So looking back on all of it and how much hell it was to go through, I gained a priceless education in multiple arenas. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And man, talk about anxiety. Um, you know, at that time too, it was like just nonstop news interviews and radio interviews and, you know, all these people like it was, I had another, uh, a guy who he's frontiersman media was the name of his company and videographer. And he came up and did an interview and put it out on YouTube and, and, uh, they reached thousands of people and I was being contacted by people from around the world. Like I was contacted by people from 11 different countries. Oh my gosh. It was nuts. And I'm thinking, how in the hell does this little tiny farm and little tiny Gwyn in the upper peninsula of Michigan that people don't even know exist. It's not on the map most of the time. And all of a sudden getting inundated with messages and, and, uh, so it was super overwhelming and, like leading up to court, I was like, I can't even believe we have to go to court to defend having chickens and sheep mm -hmm. while our neighbors are burning garbage in their burn barrels. And, you know, it was just crazy to me. And so, yeah, um, we got the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund to, I reached out to them. I'm like, is there any chance that we could hire a local attorney that I know who is also a farmer that is really into this case? And they said yes. So we got Michelle Holly as our lead attorney. Uh, this, the co-counsel was Steve Bemis out of Ann Arbor, Michigan. And then support was all the other attorneys that were part of the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. So we had a whole team of attorneys. And, and then we also had that MEEP verification in our back pocket, which proved we were compliant with everything required by the state of Michigan to be protected by a state law which renders local zoning unenforceable. Now all we had to do was go to court and prove it. Okay, so how long did the trial actually last? Two full days, uh, one and three quarters of a day, I guess. Um, but it was a two-day trial, and the courtroom was packed. And, you had a lot of local support? Oh, yeah. Like, looking out from the stand, the entire courtroom was packed, 99% of them were there to support us, then there was this little group of people over here behind the plaintiff table that were township people. A um, couple of citizens from the township, you know, that were part of the good old boy system. But there was never any of your neighbors from next door that were there saying, hey, we have a problem with this. We live next door to this. Some of our neighbors were on the stand in support of us. Like they were witnesses for our case. Um, almost every neighbor on that side of the lake signed a petition in support of us that I presented to the township before they ever filed suit. So I was proving to them that the only people that have an issue with this are you guys. Nobody, maybe a couple random other people, um, but people that knew nothing about what we were doing. I invited everybody to come to the farm. Mm -hmm. I'll show you what we're doing so you can see it's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And only one board member came. Actually, two. Two board members did. Um, so... Yeah, and there were people like walking around outside the courthouse with signs in support of us and, you know, like food freedom. And um, so it was really overwhelming. TV cameras everywhere, like when we walked in, like, so I was just intimidated from the get go. And I'd never been in court before. And mm -hmm. I'm like, not a bad guy. Why am I in court? <laughs> you know, I'm trying to do good things. And so, yeah, it was crazy. I was on the stand for five hours. Oh my gosh. Just getting drilled. And I, Libby was on the stand first. And I felt bad for her because she's an introvert. I'm an extrovert. For her to have to be up there was completely out of her arena. Like she hated every second of it. And, uh, and I felt really bad because the lawyer, the township lawyer was just an ass. And he was just, I mean, he's a lawyer and I realized that's part of their job is to go at the people. But, um, he was just being mean, you know, like just a mean spirited guy. Well, and here's this woman, your wife who had done so much for the community and all the, all her work with the farmer's market. And it, it's a slap in the face, really. 
Yeah, I was. Um, they were just like kind of putting to the side all of the good things, and it was more about we're in control here, and we get to tell you what you can and can't do in our community. And uh, but I, you know, I was up there. I was on the stand after her, um, and. Yeah, the the attorney started asking me questions, and you know, I mean, I was just shaking inside. I was a nervous wreck. My hands were sweating. You know, the judge is sitting right here, which was intimidating. You know, I was like, man, this is just too much. And and then all the people out there looking at me. You know, so mm -hmm. I'm having to talk with all these TV cameras, and you know, I was in a really bad place, and I was walking with a cane, and I was sick with Lyme disease, and stress and anxiety from all of the last three years, and just in a bad place. And then. After like the first hour or so of being up there, I was like, all right, I'm focused. I got this. Like, I know way more than this attorney knows about this entire situation. I know far more about the law than this attorney knows. He's just trying to strong arm me. He's trying to bully me. And he's trying to get me to react in an angry way to make me look bad in court. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing that. I'm going to beat him with knowledge. So I got into a comfort zone and I just started... He'd ask me a question and I would sometimes be almost political about it and I would kind of ignore his question and I would just share information that was more important to me awesome. while in a roundabout way answering his questions. And after maybe three hours, it was lunch break. And uh, so we went to lunch and, and uh, as we're eating lunch, I looked at my lawyer and I'm like, Michelle, I said, if you can, I said, don't object. Like, just don't object. And she kind of looked at me like, were you going to keep it together? I'm like, she's like, you have to promise me that you're going to keep it together. And I'm like, I'll keep it together. And she's like, okay, but if you start to lose it, I'm, I'm going to object. And I'm like, all right. And then we went back in the courtroom and, and the, I was, I just got right back into the zone and it continued. And in my opinion, I felt like I made that attorney look pretty bad. Um, he was supposed to be the guy with all the knowledge that was going to shut us down. But I felt like I was the guy that had far more knowledge and made my case for the judge to see. And, uh, but is this the same attorney that you said at some point mentioned, oh, hey, they actually are right? This, when you no, first, no, no, no. Okay. This was the actual township attorney. Um, there was another attorney in our community who just happened to be on, the, on one of the zoning boards. Okay. Um, who... Uh, I'm not going to say he was on our side, but he was smart enough to realize the law was on our side and he was trying to get the rest of them to realize that too. But he wasn't successful even as an attorney on the board to get them to understand it. So, um, you know, and at, at the time it was like, all right, so if we have to go to court and I had already read about a bunch of case law with the right to farm act and, uh, there were a lot of victories but almost every one of those victories was at the level of the Court of Appeals. Oh, wow. No farm had ever won a right to farm suit at the circuit court level. So, you know, I went into the trial with the idea that we were already going to lose at that level and that we would have to appeal. You know, so that in itself was like, all right, here we are for two days, just kind of going through the motions, theatrical, so to speak, you know, to get to an end point of, the judge saying, okay, we rule in favor of Forsyth Township so we can get on to the next part. Oh, wow. Yeah, so at the end of day two, during the judge's closing statements, I don't know how long he talked, I can't remember, but it was a pretty long closing statement. And, you know, one of the first things he said was, I find it ironic that here we are trying this case on the day before we give thanks for the bounty of the harvest. Because it was the day before Thanksgiving. I'm like, okay, he gets it. You know, like that right there lets me know that he gets the importance of farms that provide food that we're going to give thanks for tomorrow. So that was a bonus. And then he talked some more. And then one of the next things he said that caught my attention was the Buchlers are afforded the rights they are afforded under the law and the Constitution. So when he said that, I'm like, all right, there's two more really powerful things, law, Constitution. And then he said... But the township is also afforded the rights they're afforded under the Zoning Enabling Act, which I had also read and made myself very informed about. And, uh, and there are, he was right there, too. Um, and then he said, I'm going to review this case, and I will have a decision in the next 30 days. So there was no ruling. 
there was a lot of information that he had to go through. And yeah, I mean, that was two days of testimony. So and, you're basically left hanging for up to a month. Yeah. Before there was a decision. How long did it actually take before you got a, a word back? Uh, I think it took just over three weeks. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and it was like, I was anxious to get the decision, but it's like I already said, you know, we'd expected to lose. And then I think it was just before, I don't know, it was like a, the week before Christmas and my phone rings and it's, well, it's Michelle Holly. Attorney's calling me I'm like, hello. And she's like, Hey, I'm like, Hey. And she's like, we won. I was like, what? She said, we won. I'm like, no way. She's like, yeah, we did. And I, you know, we were just like, holy shit. I can't even believe it. And I'm like, I, I don't, I don't believe you. And she's like, I'm serious. And I'm like, Michelle, nobody's ever won at the circuit court level. And she's like, I know. And she's a, a pit bull in the courtroom. I'm like, she's so good. And I don't mean a pit bull in a vicious way, but she's so good in what she does in presenting the facts and the case and, and, uh, yeah, so um, we were beside ourselves. It was like a, the best early Christmas present we could ever get, you know. And and uh, so we celebrated with this victory, just waiting for the next notification of Forsyth Township is going to appeal. You were expecting them to appeal. We were. Yep. Yeah. Um, one of the things going back to the trial is uh, part of the Michigan Right to Farm Act is you can be reimbursed for all of your legal fees through the Right to Farm Act if you win. And you have to ask for that ahead of time. Like, you have to let them know that you're also going to go for reimbursement of legal fees. And because we weren't MEEP verified by the state of Michigan at the beginning of all of this, um, it was probably just over halfway through when I found that program and did that. Um, the judge ruled that the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund was only going to get reimbursed 50%. And this is reimbursement from the township. Reimbursement from the township. So now the township not only had to pay for all of their own legal fees mm -hmm. to take us to court using our tax dollars against us, they also had to use our tax dollars to reimburse the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund 50% of their cost. So it was a really expensive lesson learned by Forsyth Township at the time. Yeah, because you were willing to work with them before this ever had to go right. to court. And there were so many taxpayers that had attended some of the township meetings telling them, we don't want our tax dollars used like this. Like mm -hmm. these people aren't doing anything bad. Leave them alone, you know. Um, but that's, that's not how local government works oftentimes. That's unfortunate, <clears throat> but it's true. So now all this behind you, from this experience, tell me about the Michigan Small Farms Council and what that is. Yeah, so through all of this, I met some other folks who had been following our case, wanted to start this organization kind of as a grassroots watchdog for small farms in Michigan. And um, I was like, well, yeah, absolutely. I'll be a part of that. And this woman from Ann Arbor, Wendy Banka, like she's a super intelligent woman and uh She's like an encyclopedia when it comes to all of this kind of thing. And, and she was a person in Ann Arbor that has backyard chickens. So she's all about, um, you know, protecting our ability to um, procure and produce the foods of our choosing as long as it's done in the right way. And so seven of us at the time formed the Michigan Small Farm Council, a voluntary organization where we had people attending the Agriculture Commission meetings in Lansing every month. and. Um, just trying to get small farms and, and our voices heard at the state level um, because the people in Lansing never, ever in a million years thought that we were going to win our right to farm case. We were the first farm in the state of Michigan to win at the circuit court level and, it, and Forsyth Township did not appeal. So in Lansing, it kind of threw everybody for a loop and this Michigan Small Farm Council couldn't have had better timing because... Now, Lansing was wanting to change back how the Right to Farm Act protected farms because the Right to Farm Act came into fruition in 1981, and it was an act that was intended to protect big farms that were on the outskirts of developed communities from urban sprawl. So people would move out to the country, build a house, 
complain about farm smells, farm noises, etc. Right? The Farm Act came in 1981 to protect those farms from those complaints. So they're called nuisance complaints. And, and that's how the Right to Farm Act came to be. And then in 2000 was the amendment that um, stated if farms are compliant with these certain things, then the state law trumps local zoning and renders it unenforceable. That was the little amendment that came to protect us. Okay. So when we won, now people in Lansing are scurrying, trying to figure out how they could prevent farms like us from winning in a lake residential district and get it back to what they really wanted to protect, which was basically factory farming. So they were going to amend the law. No, they weren't going to amend the law. They were going to change language within certain policies mm. that in turn would change the intent of the law. I see. Which is not legal. You have to change a law legislatively. They didn't do that. So this farm council, you guys are, you're banding together to protect other people that are just like you that might come up against. Right. And, and you know, we didn't form as an organization that wants to go to battle. We formed as an organization that wants to work with the state agriculture department and let them know that, hey, all farms deserve protection, not just the big ones, but the little farms too. And we're here to make our voices heard so that we can work together to make sure that all farms do have the right to farm, the ones that fall under the umbrella of the requirements to gain that protection. And, you know, so we've been active now for about 10 or 11 years, I guess. Wow. Um, we're getting ready to reorganize the board. I'll, I'll be uh, recommended to take over the president position and uh, get things back to an active, like there's been kind of a standstill until this past fall where I had multiple farms reaching out to me. They were having legal issues and I was working with four different farms trying to get them legal representation and trying to get their townships to back off. One of them actually just got ruled against at the local court level, which we kind of expected. Um, so they'll be going to the Court of Appeals. <laughs> what people don't realize in the state of Michigan, or any other state probably, but Michigan um, is the state that I'm aware of. So many people have no idea how many local townships are trying to shut down small farms. And it's not, I can't say that it's just because they don't want small farms. It's far more of a control issue. It's really weird. Um, it's overreach and they tend to just ignore the state law. And my strong opinion is that they're doing it solely on the basis, like our township board member said, they don't have any money. They can't defend this. They have the ability to use your tax dollars for their attorney to fight you. And you don't have the same financial resource. It's out of your own pocket unless you're lucky enough to get farm to consumer to litigate your case. Wow. Yeah. Like there's all these things that people just don't know that I've been a resource for several farms and I don't get paid for it. You know, I've spent probably thousands of hours at this time consulting with other farms, but I know where I was and it's hard to get help and they're desperate and I'm somebody that can help them and I'll never, I'll never say no to that. I can't do that. Would it be fair to say even the stress of going through this experience in the end, it all kind of became worth it because you became this wealth of knowledge and your ability to help other people do, do the same kind of thing you were trying to do? Everything that I went through that was extreme hell at the time, I wouldn't change any of it. Because number one, it's got me to where I am today, but it allows me to help so many other people when there's nobody else they can reach out to. And that's important. Yeah, for sure. Like, I, I, I really love the pay it forward aspect of all the things that I've learned, you know. And, and I, when I went through it, I didn't have support. I had nobody. Mm -hmm. Like, it was me and Libby. She was my support. She, you know, I'm surprised that she just didn't kick me to the curb. I'm like, get out of here. You're just bringing nothing but trouble, you know. But she stuck with me, and, and uh, now we're just doing our thing and, and it allows me to help other people. So that brings me to my next point. I think one of the things you're very passionate about is the impact and advocacy that you can have at a community level, um, the broader sense of community within other farmers, but also just educating the general population in what it is that you do and, and the difference 
between an operation like yours and say like a factory farm. So I had mentioned that I got to join you for one of your hog harvests and see it firsthand. But can you kind of give me an example of what what other things you might do that bring people together to kind of edu- help educate and inform what it is that you're doing and how it differentiates from, say, what people would generally think of when they think of farm? Let's just go right to the to eating meat aspect of things real quick. You know, I share a lot of what I do on social media as a way to not just inspire people, but at I want them to understand, like, you can do this. Like, you can do this. Um, And what I'm doing is something that's completely different than a pig that's been raised in a building with 20,000 other pigs or whatever. Um, So one thing that I do is I open up my farm and I, I offer free workshops to teach people from live animal to putting it on our plates. And to me... Completing that circle is one of the most important aspects of eating animal products. That's why we were vegetarians for as long as we were, because we didn't know that full circle. We were, we were ignorant. Um, so I took it upon myself to take responsibility to learn that circle. And I want everything that I've learned through doing and from other mentors, I feel like it's one of my most important jobs as a farmer to share that. So that it, the more people I can connect with, how that meat gets to our plate and show them an ethical way of doing so, the more people will have a changed perspective on, hey, maybe if we support farms like this, then together we can combat industrial agriculture of animals and plants. It definitely opened my eyes. I kind of had a little bit of an expectation of what I was going to see, but to get to experience it firsthand right to the point of um, us cooking up some of the food that we had harvested that day, it was very much a full circle and in a in a very beautiful way. It was just, it was very enlightening. And, and I had a, a great, a sense of gratitude to experience it because I feel like a lot of people will never get a chance to experience that in their lifetime. Well, and, and you know, part of the reason they won't is because most farms don't do this. Mm-hmm. You know, our our government policies are such that you can't harvest an animal and sell it at the farmer's market. For example, you have to take it to a USDA facility to have it killed there, processed there, and have the stamp on it so that you can then retail it directly to customers at a market or wholesale it to a restaurant. So the regulations prevent a lot of that from happening. For me, I was like, you know, I don't need to sell the meat at the farmer's market. Most of it's for us anyway. I use a lot of it for bartering, but... It's counterintuitive to spend all the time, effort, and money that I spend to raise animals beyond organically and then put them in a truck or trailer only to have the end of their life be horrible, stressful, hormones being released that literally chemically change the makeup of the meat. So it's the last couple of days could essentially negate the entire year of work and love and compassion and quality that I've put into those animals. So I had to get over, I can't kill my own animals. I had to get over that. I had to put my emotions to the side and realized, not about me. Mm-hmm. This, has, this isn't about me. Mm-hmm. It's about those animals. They deserve a death that's every bit as good as their life, which is quick, stress-free, not even knowing it's coming, you know. And then when I do it, you witnessed I keep my hands on them the entire time until every last ounce of life is gone. And that energy exchange is so powerful, like powerful to the point that even the people that are there watching it can't understand unless they did it. Mm -hmm. Um, Like I told you before, I've had vegans come to my farm who reached out to me. They wanted to come visit and possibly even incorporate some animal products back into their life because a practitioner had told them this is the only way you're going to get the nutrition that your body's lacking right now. This would be good for you. And uh, I had two vegans, a vegetarian and a carnivore. Four females come and participate in a hog harvest. And, you know, the one thing I hope when these people come to my farm every time is participate, learn, have these conversations, see a different way. And some of them have left with eggs. Some of them have left with meat. 
Some of them participated in a hog harvest. Some participated in chicken harvest. Some of them actually did the cutting of the necks of the chickens, uh, cried while they were doing it. You know, like the, you can't get a deeper connection to your food than that. But the one thing that is in common with every single one of them is that every one of them left with a different perspective. And that's what's going to change the food system moving forward. If I can get more people to understand what I'm doing is also combating the industrial farming of animals, then together we can combat it more successfully. That makes a lot of sense. Like, I'm not the enemy. I tell people I'm also an animal rights person. That's why I raise and harvest my animals the way I do. Because we're never going to get people to stop eating meat, ever. It's not going to happen. But it's, it's about what happens in the process of where does this meat come from and what is the ethical and sustainable practice that can be put into place. Yeah. If we could get more small farms in every community doing what we're doing, and I'm not saying that we're like the shining example and we're the best, but what I'm saying is if we get more farms that are doing it with integrity and doing things ethically, then consumers have more options to shop locally and support that. And then what does that mean? It means factory farms start losing business, right? Like we vote with our dollars kind of a thing. So what would you suggest for people to get more involved or what, what can they do at their own level to help support small farmers? Well, first of all, find, find the small farms in your community. Go to the farmer's market, talk to farmers, you know, try to, try to learn more about why what we're doing is important and how it's going to benefit the community in the long run, how it's going to benefit your own personal health in the long run, how it's going to benefit the environment and everything around us, the water quality. Like there's so many positive things about it that everybody in the community wins if we have more of us doing it. Like this whole trying to shut small farms down thing doesn't make any sense at all, especially with the direct, like COVID should have taught us that, right? Like the alleged food shortages and egg prices skyrocketing and shelves being empty. You know, if you want security, food security, uh, it's far more secure at the local level. The industrial food system is a house of cards waiting to collapse. I'd agree. Yeah. I mean, it's It's scary, actually. We're using the word food, and a lot of it's not even food. (laughs) That's a really good point, too. So what you do at your level and the care that you take, um, something that I've heard uh, about your practice is you don't use any corn, soy-free, corn-free, GMO-free feed with your animals. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Because that obviously seems like it's a big differentiation from larger farms. Yeah, you know, soy and corn are two of, they are the two primary livestock feed sources. Um, soy and corn grow are being grown everywhere. Um, and if you're talking at the conventional level, like it's just thousands and thousands of acres of corn and soy, GMO corn and soy that are being sprayed heavily with chemicals. Um, there are also organic soy and corn operations, but I've chosen to eliminate both of them. Corn is basically, it's a, it's used for energy. Soy is over 40, 40% protein. So it's a, you feed a bunch of soy, you can grow things quickly. Like people are growing these high, uh, genetically modified Cornish cross chickens and they're getting them up to like six, eight pounds in six weeks. Where their breasts are hanging on the ground and it's obviously inhumane. Muscles grow far quicker than their skeleton does. So their bones aren't strong enough to handle the weight of the animals. They break legs. Their hearts can't keep up. So their hearts explode. They die of heart attacks. Um, it's absurd. Like it is kind of a form of animal abuse in a sense, feeding them like that. I mean, you can also raise them and not overfeed them and keep them healthy. I've, I've seen it happen. I raised them once. Um, but it's just weird. And, you know, soy isn't necessary. Corn isn't necessary. Corn is in, basically an empty carbohydrate. But it's used because it's cheap. It's used because it's cheap and abundant. And it's government subsidized. A whole bunch of it is. Yep. Um, conventionally speaking, um, organic farms typically aren't subsidized quite like that. But um, yeah, so soy and corn, they're, they're the mainstay for most livestock. And I chose to eliminate it because, you know, soy alters estrogen levels and um, none of us necessarily need it. Like you are what you eat eats, right? So we are what we eat. So are the animals. 
And if we're giving them an optimal species appropriate diet, um, then when we eat it, it's going to be better for us too. That's a really good point. And one that I don't think a lot of people think of. They, they think, don't. I'm making a healthy choice. This is organic. Yeah. Most people don't even consider what the animal, like if they go buy eggs, they don't consider what the chicken ate or how, what the quality of the egg might be, nutritionally speaking. Um, but I have customer, I have one customer who has severe soy and corn allergies. She wasn't able to eat eggs for over 20 years. She found my eggs and started eating them and has zero uh, reactions. And, and in turn, she said that her health has significantly improved since she started incorporating my eggs into her diet. And I think a lot of it is people just aren't exposed to it. They don't really know. So I would encourage anyone who's never had a farm fresh egg from a chicken versus something you would buy at a general grocery store to try the difference. I mean, you can see the difference, the quality. You can. The color of the yolk, the taste. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the freshness. Like, mm -hmm. you'll just see the, the, like, my eggs at the grocery store have to have a 30-day sell-by date. Most industrial factory farmed eggs that come to the grocery store are already 30 to 60 days old when they get there. So my eggs at their expiration date, like the date they have to be pulled from the shelf, are fresher than the other eggs when they get there. Wow. How is that fair? Well, it's, it's just the... It's logistics. I see. Right? Like, I'm going a mile to deliver my eggs. Who knows where those other eggs are coming from? And these huge, like, it, some of these places will have a million laying hens in buildings. You know, so they're, they're able to put eggs into a cooler for 30 days or however many days before they get delivered. And then they have to go onto a semi. Then however long it takes for the semi to get to where it's going to the distributor. And then from the distributor to the grocery store, like, there's all these middlemen. You know, I don't have a middleman. And I kind of, I love your tagline, grateful eggs laid by hippie chicks. Yeah, that started as a joke way back when I had this top hat rooster. Top hat rooster has long hair and I had long hair at the time. And we've been called hippies for years by people who are grateful dead fans, dead heads. And, uh, and yeah, Kramer was this rooster's name and, you know, he'd hang out and like roost on the handlebar my chainsaw and like you'd pour beer on the ground or something he would drink beer like he was just <laughs> one of the guys you know so he turned into our he was our hippie chicken and and i did that kind of as a joke that caught on and, and you know the lightning bolt from like the grateful dead steal your face symbol and and to be clear some of the grateful dead members have my shirts i've met some of them they're cool with oh, it wow, like, that's awesome. yeah they had no problem with it so what a cool story yeah so where do you see the outlook as far as the potential for growth? Like where, where do you feel like this is all going as people begin to wake up and want to get more involved in their food supply? And what do you think the next 10 years look like? Do you see any changes coming down the pipe that might affect you or people like you? You know, what I see happening is there's far more of a demand for people wanting to learn this stuff. There aren't a lot of us that are willing to be teachers as farmers i mean it's hard because you know, we work seven days a week to maintain a farm and manage everything and i don't have employees we don't have employees it's just us and and uh so like for these little workshops you know i have to turn people away um a lot of the workshops that are similar to mine where the farmers are monetizing everything they're expensive and unachievable for a lot of people financially so what i see is more and more people wanting to learn the skill sets and wanting to start homesteading, um, I encourage people all the time, you need to take responsibility for at least some of your own food supply, be it a tomato plant in a five-gallon bucket on your porch or six chickens in your backyard, whatever it is. But if you're completely dependent on the industrial food system, you're in a really bad place. But if you can depend on yourself for some of it, and even if you're not going to harvest a pig, come and get the skill sets. Because if you don't know how to end the life and process an animal, you're also sitting in a bad place if the food system collapses. And now with technology, I think there's so much access to information out there. And one of the guys that was at the hog harvest this weekend, Brian, was talking about how I asked him, I said, how did you learn how to do all this? And he said, YouTube. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can learn anything on YouTube. But to get the hands-on experience, how many people do you think have come through your farm over the years? Oh, geez. Um couple hundred anyway you know and i i have a lot of repeat people but
but I try to limit that. Mm -hmm. Like if I have new people that want to come and I have people travel from far, you know, like I've had people travel from out of state, from several different surrounding Midwest states. And uh, I could probably just become a a homesteading small farm teacher (laughs) and I could fill up a class every weekend. You know, that I think that's where things are heading. Do you think that has to do with your involvement with social media and the fact that people, uh, I feel like I got to know you more through your social media before I ever met you because people gravitate towards others that live this life with passion. And now with putting that out there, I think people are curious yep. and they want to know more. Yeah. And that's pretty much the reason I have social media as a tool because our lawsuit garnered a lot of attention and like I have people come up to me in public that I don't know and they know me and they call me by name and you know it's like a I feel bad then because I don't know who they are and you know so it brought all this attention I only have a couple thousand followers on Instagram or whatever it's not like you know I'm, I'm some influencer or something um but I'm a believer in changing the system from the bottom up which means we have to do it locally first and I'm more concerned about getting people in my own community to come and be part of what we're doing. And that community can be further reaching like Brian and and Jack coming up this weekend, you know, one from the Thumb of Michigan and one from Traverse City. And and, uh, to have that connectivity with people that are doing the same thing throughout Michigan is important too. But in order to have resiliency in our own communities, I want more people from our immediate community to come and participate in what we're doing. And that's why I've also opened up our farm over the years to field trips from anywhere from preschool to Northern Michigan University classes coming down, you know. So it's, to me, it's one of the most important things that I can do as a farmer is teach and share the skill sets that are necessary to be, to have some level of food independence. We can't be dependent on somebody else to feed us. Absolutely. That's a really good point. Talking about community, I hear that there's something else that goes on in your farm. And that would be your practicing of cold water immersion and the Wim Hof method. So tell me about this. How did this get started? Because I know there's a lot of people that have taken a cold dip in that Johnson Lake. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, You know, so a friend of ours talked about Wim Hof at our place a handful of years ago. Uh, A friend of mine, Nick, and, uh, you know, we were taking sauna one night and he's like, hey, you guys want to jump in the lake? And I'm thinking... In October, man, <laughs> you know, or November. I think it was November. I'm like, hell no, I don't want to go in the lake. And he's like, oh no, come on, you know. And then he talked about Wim Hof, and I'd never heard of Wim Hof at that point. And uh, so we did like some quick power breathing stuff that he showed us, and went in the lake, and I was like, all right, it wasn't that bad. And you know, I'd always had this aversion to cold water from my spine injury because it would like tighten my back up, and it just wasn't good. And and cold water sucks, right? <laughs> Well, we did it and it was quick and and I'm like, all right, that wasn't too bad. And so at that point we were aware of it. And then, uh, you know, we did it from there on out. We'd start toying with getting in the lake during saunas and just going in for a little bit. Not like running in and jumping in and getting out, like trying to do it 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 with intention. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then all of a sudden somebody says, hey, there's this Wim Hof instructor coming to Marquette to do these workshops. And. And I think Libby had seen it on social media or something, you know. And so she came home from work one day and she's like, hey, uh, I signed us up for this Wim Hof workshop at the Superior Dome. And I'm like, you did what? And uh, she's like, yeah. She's like, it's four hours long and then we end it and we get in ice water. And I was like, four hours long and we got to get in a thing of ice water? I don't know about that. And I'm like, all right, I'll, here, whatever, let's go. And so we went and and met this guy named Tim Mann, you know, from Lower Michigan and you know, he started talking in front of this group of people in this classroom in the dome and telling his story, which is so powerful. Like it makes some of my stories just seem like whatever, you know, but I mean, this guy's story of being smoked by a drunk driver at 80 miles an hour, he was on the side of the road. Like he immediately had my attention. Like this guy's gone through some shit like I have, you know, and, and, uh, he said, you know, I discovered this Wim Hof guy and you know, none other than on the Joe Rogan podcast. And, and, uh, he learned all about Wim Hof and he's like, it helped him so much through his recovery, you know? So he, he had, like, I went from not really being interested to, I was all in and I'm like, just like absorbed in what he's talking about. And, and this 
Wim Hof method practice, like between the three pillars of mindset, breath work, and cold water immersion, essentially saved his life. Like he became addicted to opioids after his accident and was in a really bad, dark place like I was. And we both were suicidal in our independent situations. And and then all of a sudden, something came into his life that helped save his life. And he's like, well, now I got to share this with other people. So we were both on this path of darkness. Something came in, shined light, and we both got to a point of, okay, now we need to pay it forward. And after the workshop, I chatted with Tim, and he actually lives in the my hometown, oh, which wow. was crazy. He's like, he's like, I'm like, where do you live? And he's like, oh, down by Jackson. And I'm like, but where? And he's like, Grass Lake. And I'm like, Grass Lake, no shit. I said, I grew up there. And he's like, no way. And then we just hit it off. And and so we went out to dinner that night and I said, hey, I said, do you ever want to come back and do a workshop at our place at our farm? You know, I said, we'd live on a lake. And he's like, really? I'm like, yeah. So we scheduled a workshop, sold out two workshops that weekend, 25, you know, and it was the first time he'd ever sold out a workshop. And that was going on two years ago now. And we've held at this point, I think, 16 workshops at our place. We've had a couple hundred people come through our home. Out of those couple hundred people, I think all of them said there's no way that I can get in the ice water for two minutes. After learning Tim's, after listening to Tim's story and learning all the science behind it, doing the breath work and having the power of a group of people doing it together, every single one of them did the full two minutes in the ice water. Uh, so it's just another way for us to open up our home and farm to help initiate other people to take some responsibility and control for their own well-being and the Wim Hof method has helped so many people that have come through our home like I I still get feedback from a lot of people and we've met so many incredible people it's been awesome so for those who, who don't know tell us a little bit what is the <clears throat> Wim Hof method it, it incorporates breath work it does yeah so one of the main things is mindset like shifting your mindset to you know I can do this you know, because when you think about getting in, like right now, I've been, the last three nights, we've been taking sauna and cold plunging with the hog harvest crew and, and, uh, you know, the water's 32 degrees. I mean, it's super cold. The water only needs to be under 60 degrees to gain benefits from cold water immersion. Under 45 degrees is better. Um, but so there's the mindset of shifting your mindset to, I can do hard things kind of a thing. And then there's breath work and the breath work is magic. Like it's, it's the one part of it that I think people really underestimate when they come into a workshop. And it's probably the most powerful part of the entire workshop, doing those three rounds of really hardcore breath work together. Because it takes you to a place that you didn't know that you could achieve. And then it's when you're done, it prepares your body for that cold shock. You know, it's called hormetic stress. Cold and heat shock both do it. Um, but the breath work prepares you for that cold shock. And when people get in the water and get through the first 20, 30 seconds with some long exhales, all of a sudden they settle in. And then before they know it, the two minutes is up. I've personally experienced this. So just recently I went to Tractor Supply and I got myself a 120 gallon water trough like you would use for livestock and i filled it up in my garage with hose water and just for some context it is february in upper michigan here so that water's pretty cold it's not quite frozen in the gar garage but it's cold and we put it outside of our sauna and going through the process i have been reading a bit about the wim hof method and getting yourself into that mental state through being aware of your breath and it is it is fascinating for anyone who's interested in trying it. There's a point, usually for me, it's around 40 seconds when I get into the water where you have this release. I'm guessing what's happening is your body's releasing that those endorphins where it, it kind of you just become calm. And um, the overall effects after you're done with a really good breath work sauna slash cold plunge session, it's incredible. I yeah. mean, you feel amazing. It's mind-blowing, really. And, you know, there's a huge movement of people doing this now. Um, the one thing that I will stress, being that we're talking about it here, um, there's a huge safety factor that goes into this, and it's not something that people should just go try without learning more about it. Mm -hmm. um, because it's a huge, dangerous 
there's a huge danger factor to it as far as hypothermia. Like a lot of people, I shouldn't say a lot, but several people have died trying to do the Wim Hof stuff because they were doing the breath work in the water, for example, passed out, drowned. Uh, Several people get hypothermia. What they don't realize is your body doesn't reach its coldest temperature, its coldest core temperature until after you get out of the water. So we just had an instructor from Germany come for our last round of workshops. And the way he put it to people was the cold plunge starts once you get out. That's when your body gets cold. And then you have to do these things to warm up. Um, So I can't stress enough to people, if you have the opportunity to take a fundamentals workshop, it's a one-time thing. You learn the skills and the science behind it that you need in order to practice it safely and then benefit your health for the rest of your life. So if people want to learn more about it, we have two more workshops coming up in March, March 2nd, March 3rd. Uh, Go to trainthebrainllc.com. Tim Mann is his name. Um, Tons of information. He's the only certified Wim Hof instructor in Michigan. And incredible guy. Uh, We'll keep doing workshops at Shady Grove Farm with him. So check out his website, trainthebrainllc.com, and you can come and join us sometime, and I'll even give you a farm tour. (laughs) That's a bonus. And I I often share some of my cured meats and stuff, too. Which, if you haven't had that, you're definitely missing out. I got a a chance to try that this weekend. It was amazing. Any final words, Randy, regarding advice you have to anyone who is interested in learning more about homesteading or aspiring to live a more sustainable lifestyle similar to what you've been doing? You know, connect with your local farms. Um, There are some of us that are willing to teach, but most farms will allow you to come and visit the farm, ask questions, take a farm tour, um, go get inspired. Follow people on social media. There's so many people on social media doing cool shit. Uh, I follow a ton of other farms, you know, and you can follow bigger farms like White Oak Pastures in Bluffton, Georgia, um, doing huge regenerative, like they were all industrial agriculture and and when will harris took over the farm he switched it over like there's just magical things happen happening in the regenerative agriculture world but yeah reach reach out to some of us that are willing to teach and share skill sets and knowledge and you know i i'm happy to give people farm tours and talk about our permaculture system and how to integrate things and make things work you don't need 40 acres if you have a city lot You can do some pretty cool things and I can talk to you about what you can do and how to incorporate some livestock and food growing, you know, plants and whatnot into a really small space. Um, My main thing of advice is don't hold back. Go for it. Like there's no better time than now to start producing some of your own food. That's awesome. And I will link all of Randy's social media handles in the show notes, along with some of the other things that we talked about today. So people can reference that. Yeah. And, you know, I, and I also want to go back and touch on like the Michigan small farm council stuff. If you're a farmer in Michigan, join the Michigan small farm council. It's free. Um, and, and as Michelle said, there'll be links to it. Um, and then join the farm to consumer legal defense fund too. That one costs, I think $125 a year. But what you get from that, like the resources are priceless when it comes down to, you know, you didn't think you were going to have to defend your farm and all of a sudden you do. But if you're not a member, I can't help you. Farm to consumer can't help you. Um, we should have the right to procure and produce the foods of our choosing. And, and uh, even if you're zoned agriculture, it doesn't matter. I am working with farms right now that are zoned agriculture whose townships are trying to shut them down. So Join those organizations. If you have questions, reach out to me. I can direct you as well. Um, But it's really important that we all come together on this to protect small farms, not just in the state of Michigan, but everywhere. Like Michigan had, I say had because there's been some changes, but it still has one of the strongest right to farm acts in the country. And we, we just need to have more farmers standing up and to be informed enough to be able to stand up and have the confidence to stand up to local governments. Awesome. Well, Randy, it has been a pleasure. Thank you for coming and talking with us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be your first guest. Fantastic. Yeah. All right.